Luigi Zingales. Very well, welcome to Digital Markets Research Hub. It's a great pleasure to, to have an opportunity to discuss some competition law and policy related and economics related problems with you. And I wanted to start this conversation with quite um, self-evident in many respects, but obviously not very directly linked to the to the substance of, of theoretical or philosophical discussions. A coincidence, namely you, you chair Stigler Center, which is one of the trendsetters, agenda setters of competition policy, but it is uh, situated it, and it is hosted by the University of Chicago. So it is part and parcel of, of this institution, this, this great, remarkable institution with, with many uh, channels, many schools in, in different areas of science and knowledge. But for competition policy, it is strongly associated with Chicago School. It is a metaphor, and it, obviously the school has many iterations, very, very different channels, but yet. Chicago School was a pioneer of law and economics, rational, rational approach to competition, law, rationality-based approach to competition, law and policy, Stigler Center, in many respects, while being independent academically and while while giving the the floor to different views and positions in your in your different events which are very impactful still you can by looking at at your opinion how, which you develop in many in many places you are in many respects in dissonance with with the, the approach pioneered by chicago school is it just a coincidence can you elucidate on this please uh Sure, with pleasure. I think that uh, most people think that uh, Chicago, the University of Chicago view is a religion, it's not a product of uh, science and evolution. And also they lack uh, historical co context uh, because uh, in a sense, the people who deviated from the history of the University of Chicago are at some level uh, Friedman, Stiegler, and our director, they were students of Henry Simons. And Henry Simons in the 30s and 40s was uh, a pioneer of the use of antitrust. And, uh, and then uh, I think under the weight of uh, evidence, uh, many of the leaders of the Chicago, of the then Chicago School, that was Friedman, uh, Stiegler, and, and director, move in a more critical view of, of the antitrust. And, uh, and so when this happened, I think we're at the time when uh, uh, mergers were prohibited when uh, the combined market share was 7.5%. So we're really talking about uh, very, very little concentration. And so I think that uh, what we are underestimating is uh, the, the real... Uh, uh, essence of the University of Chicago is to look very closely at the data and uh, and be informed by data. And I think that the data have changed. So what uh, in in the in the forties and fifties, I think that uh, students of uh, Henry Simons, while trained in the perspective of uh, uh, being very strong antitrust enforcer, uh, slowly move away from this because uh, they thought that the antitrust at the time had overreached. Um, and, uh, and it's only natural that uh, more than 50 years later, uh, the University of Chicago looks at the data and say, maybe now the anti-antitrust has overreached and we need to bring the pendulum back to a more uh, normal level. Pendulum back. I think at a, at a recent event, which we, which we, we both were, were present, one of the speakers may keynote speakers made a very interesting observation, self-evident, that when pendulum swings, it usually doesn't stop at the middle. Do you think it's th the risk is high to somehow to throw the, the baby with the waters and to ignore these elements of commensurability, which are so conventional and so convenient, make, making the life of difficult trade-offs, prima facie at least, easier to, 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 to make? Are we moving too far in, in our... Ex is the criticism of the previous dogma excessive? Um, as usual, uh, some of the criticism might be excessive, and uh, there is definitely the risk of overdoing it. Uh, I don't think we're there yet, and I think you said a, a, a magic word. We need to learn from the past. In a sense, if, we, if, if the pendulum is simply back and forth, uh, then we're not making any progress. 
uh, you know, there was a, a very famous Italian philosopher, uh, Gian Battista Vico, that uh, was saying that there are these spirals, but uh, as long as the spirals have a direction of progress, then they are useful. So, yes, they, they, we need to bring the pendulum back, but uh, uh, in the process, we have to keep what uh, is good and shed what is bad. And in, the, in so doing, we are not going back to square one. We are making some progress forward. You are a, a U.S. academic. You are affiliated within U U.S., one of the flagship institutions for decades. But you also uh, are part of, of EU vision, so to say. You, you belong to, 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 to the cluster of those who discuss the nitty-gritty of the DMA. And I will have several questions about the DMA, which is for the EU-UK context is the most important trajectory of development of, of regulation in digital markets. But I wanted to ask you a question about the United States because you, you observe it from the inside. So we hear the main um, milestones somehow how when they change but what is your impression about the the the, the state of affairs in, in in u.s antitrust policy in 2024 do you think the enthusiasm is there still uh, how important the next electoral cycle i know it's somehow many questions but your your position i think that uh, uh, there is clearly a uh wind in the direction of stronger antitrust enforcement, which is more bipartisan than we make it to be. In a sense, I think that uh, at the moment, the flag is carried by the Democratic Party, or at least by one wing of the Democratic Party. Uh, but there is a wing of the Republican Party, uh, like Josh Hawley and company, who feel in the, in the same way. So, um, of course, there is a center, there is a center of the Democratic Party and there is a center of the Republican Party who are not particularly sensitive of this because uh, they're more sensitive to business interests. Uh, but, uh, but so I think that uh, there is a very big uh, uh, push that takes uh, two forms and uh, the more traditional form of saying, look, we see evidence of market power everywhere. We see evidence of market power in uh, uh, was this, uh, hearing the story about uh, uh, the anesthesiology market in, in Texas. A private equity firm has uh, done what is called in jargon a roll up, has, bar has bought a lot of small anesthesiologists' office, put them all together. And you know, if you want to do surgery, you need to have an anesthesiology. There is no question uh, about that. And if they're all or many of them belonging to one, uh, firm, uh, they dictate the price. And so uh, they charge a fortune. And, and as a patient, you don't even see this hitting you because you don't go and pick the anesthesiologist, right? And is basically given to you. And then you, uh, you have to foot the bill. Uh, so I think evidence like this are uh, widespread and, and people are feeling the, the, the cost and reacting to this. So this is the most... Uh, popular part of antitrust. Uh, then there is the, uh, another part, which is the, a little bit more complicated to sell to the average person, but uh, uh, because uh, when you look at uh, the digital platforms, the digital platforms don't charge you up front an arm and a leg. And this is the, much of the antitrust movement in the United States was driven by consumers being upset, starting with the railways, because the railways were overcharging for transportation of goods, right? Um, when you look at Facebook, you look at Google, it's very hard to argue they overcharge you, at, at least in the form of monetary payoff. Of course, they get they get your data, which is worth a fortune, but that's a different story. So there is not like an enormous amount of uh, uh, economic reaction to this. However, more and more people, uh, both on the left and on the right, feel uh, the increased amount of power that uh, uh, these platforms have. So um, I don't think you were in Brussels last year, but uh, uh, and I see you're wearing a, 
Ukrainian flag. So last year, what I say is imagine that at the beginning of the Ukrainian war, uh, the more the prevailing social network, the prevailing uh, engine search in the world was Yandex. And uh, the prevailing social uh, media was uh, contact. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, the phenomenal communication uh, uh, battle waged by Zelensky would have been impossible. So, uh, and, and to these days, uh, we don't see, uh, we, 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 we do see that uh, few organizations have a disproportionate power in shaping the overall conversation. And I think that's a, a real threat to, to democracy. And, and uh, again, I think both the left of the Democratic Party and the right of the Republican Party see this as a problem. If you are in the center, you probably like this situation because you want to censor every form of dissent. Uh, but I uh, think that uh, uh, the, the reaction is is very strong and will get only stronger over time because sooner or later everybody will uh, figure out that uh, uh, what they say has been uh, uh, sort of a censor or somehow uh, downplayed or somehow made it difficult to achieve and so on and so forth. So I think that uh, the, the political dimension of the antitrust is something more difficult to uh, capture right away and uh, at the beginning is uh, uh, less appealing to a broader public, but I think eventually everybody will come around and be concerned about it. And I remember, by the way, Luigi, a few years ago, or probably uh, time runs so quickly, it was not a few years ago, quite a while ago, when be, before it became a mainstream, at one of your events, you mentioned that it's not you, you don't necessarily have to make political impact, the very ability of making political impact is already a threat for, for the foundations of, of democratic uh, process in such, uh, in such mature democracies. And this creates, and the fact that everybody sees the screen differently, the choice, choice is, you know, we are being navigated by so many self-evident today ways uh, is alarming in many respects. But there is a significant difference between EU and US digital markets. Namely, there is no EU big tech. So yeah. I wanted to ask you to reflect how important in your view for the geoeconomic strategic interests, if we take the vocabulary of fourth industrial revolution, comparing big tech with infrastructure, implying that it's better to have your own big tech than not to have it. How important this factor is in, 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 in these two different approaches to digital markets? In a sense, there are some uh, uh, immediate but less important effects right away. So, for example, incentive to regulate. But if we think more of the big picture strategically, I think that this is a gigantic uh, handicap for Europe, because uh, uh, especially when it comes to uh, artificial intelligence, it will become crucial uh, uh, for a lot of industrial activities, a lot of service activity, and unfortunately, also for warfare. And so I think that uh, uh, in that sense, Europe put itself in a corner by putting the uh, primacy of privacy over everything. In a sense, I am not <clears throat> very sympathetic to uh, some of the stuff that the United States do. And I do think that uh, uh, privacy is important. However, it's not an absolute uh, uh, right over everything. Uh, and uh, we know, for example, that in the cure of diseases, uh, having uh, reduced privacy so that actually I can connect uh, like a very simple thing. I can connect your health outcome to your searches on Google. And so we can uh, pretty quickly find out uh, what symptoms people who eventually develop uh, uh, lethal diseases have, okay? And uh, there are some diseases like uh, uh, cancer to the pancreas, et cetera, that uh, 
are such a killer because you cannot detect them early. And if we can uh, identify the, the signs that uh, developed before, we can cure uh, hundreds of thousands and not millions of people. So um, I, I, I respect the privacy, but I think that making an absolute right of the privacy is really getting uh, across uh, the development of uh, uh, AI. And that, I think, is a losing proposition. Let me have a follow-on question with this. Developing further this uh, trajectory of thinking, so to say, digital authoritarianism shows diff many instances of succeeding. Obviously, there was huge gap in of, of technology innovation and knowledge and capabilities 20 years or 25 years ago when the game started. And if, if, if we follow this way of thinking, we come up to a very hard question that if, if you do comprehensive scanning of all, uh, of all digital foot, footprints, if you can scale it up and use so pervasive data, obviously there are still shortcomings in knowledge and know-how and computational power, et cetera. But they are, if, if we look at the, let's say 20 years forward, they are not irreparable or they are treatable. Is there, is, a, is there a kind of dystopian danger of uh, digital becoming more uh, adjustable to the authoritarianism? There is no doubt that digital uh, can favor authoritarianism uh, a great deal. And, uh, and I am very sympathetic to uh, the fear that uh, most people have, and um, also potentially of the roadblocks they want to put in the on the way in order to block this authoritarianism. But this is where I think that the trust uh, uh, that people have toward the government uh, or the quality of the social contract existing in the country is very, very important. So you go to Sweden, and as you know, in all Scandinavian countries, citizens share basically every data with the government. Uh, why they're not afraid? Because I'm sorry to say, but uh, Sweden in the last uh, 100 or 150 years uh, has been a very benign state. Uh, you go to Germany and people are afraid even to have their name on the bank account. Why? Because the memory of the Nazi regime is still alive and well. Okay, so I think that uh, uh, this is, in my view, a proof of, number one, how important is democracy and how important it is to maintain the credibility and the function of democracy because the damage that uh, this variation imposes uh, can be very, very long-lasting. So. Uh, 80 years after uh, the Nazi regime was still in a world in which people are afraid of their own government. And I think that that is a, a big difference and a potential big comparative advantage of the U.S. government, uh, unless the U.S. government goes in, in the direction of authoritarianism, and that would be problematic. Of course, there are industries where we already see that th those who were uh, outsiders become trendsetters, let's say telecommunication industry, 5G technology, but that's, we, there is no clear answer to this, I understand. But let us somehow remove the ideological uh, components from the conversation. And I wanted to ask your view, if you look at the development of digital markets in different parts of the globe, not at the regulation of digital markets, because I know we are proud of, of being Brussels effect, global trendsetters, as if it's enough. It's another question, but I wanted to ask which model, in your view, uh, would be worth noting in terms of the, 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 the dy dynamism or maybe they, they do something differently than, than the traditional uh, digital markets approach would, would envisage? So I, I am a big fan of the Indian uh, stack system. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but is a set of technologies developed uh, 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 through a private public partnership and uh, based on interoperability and competition. Um, and I think that the challenge that uh, we're all facing in a digital world is that uh, there are natural uh, 
um, network externalities in digital. And uh, uh, the only way to fight uh, these network externalities is by imposing a very strong uh, interoperability. Uh, without interoperability, we are basically condemned to have uh, a few digital monopolies. Now, if you're China and you want to have digital monopolies because those are easier to control, I think that uh, that's fine. But if you are a democratic country like uh, Europe is, I think that uh, you want to have multiplicity of providers because uh, uh, a, a digital monopoly would be too powerful for its own good. And this is a, it's too powerful in the United States. Imagine in Europe where there is not a really strong central government. Imagine there was a European Google. Uh, how powerful would it be? It would be more powerful than any government in, in, in Europe, right? So uh, we, we want to avoid uh, this at all costs. And the only way to avoid it while maintaining uh, the incentives to develop in fact, enhancing the incentive develop is to have a common framework and interoperability within this common framework. And, and I think India has achieved um, to do this very effectively. And I think that uh, I've been saying that for a while now, Europe needs to ally with India because I don't think it's the time to develop its own framework. It's, it started to be late. Um, and uh, uh, Creating a Indo-European uh, uh, alliance and market uh, could provide a very powerful uh, alternative to the two blocks existing in the world, uh, which are China and the United States. And I think that uh, in uh, uh, we need uh, we need a, a third uh, hole, if you want, and uh, uh, India is a natural opponent of China because they are at the border. So a strong anti-China um, desires, and uh, I think that uh, uh, for you for Europe is the uh, way to go. Uh, now, of course, uh, this is made difficult by the fact that uh, Europe is protected by the United States, so the NATO alliance is very important. Um, but you know, uh, if Trump gets elected president and dumps NATO. Maybe that's the moment in which uh, this might develop. This sounds intuitively very interesting. We had a panel on, on, the, on the Indian digital competition policy, and you can definitely sense the energy, creative, technical as well. But obviously, I cannot go f further with this because I'm not very competent. Obviously, BRICS would immediately pop up in, 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 as a counter argument, but I, I don't know much about no, but the... but BRICS the... is just an acronym okay. invented by... An investment banker. I don't think there is a natural alliance uh, uh, the interest. Uh, as I said, China and India, in fact, they are competitors and they have a uh, sort of tension between the two. So I think that uh, uh, I very much uh, uh, push for an Indo-European alliance. Uh, this will be only natural because, after all, we are all Indo-European, right? So, <laughs> And most of our languages are Indo-European. <laughs> Indeed. And this is the statement of fact. Let us move a little bit back to competition policy. And you, you coined the phrase, we need to develop much more than antitrust policy. We need to develop competition policy. Explain, please. Oh, this is very much linked to the previous question. Is, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, there, there is still a prevailing view that uh, if you just let... Uh, uh, competitors go or firms go, uh, then uh, competition will uh, prevail no matter what. And uh, I don't think that was the case in the past, but particularly is not the case today. I think that uh, uh, there is really a, a tension between uh, the, the new technology that can naturally to lead to uh, uh, networks and IITs and uh, enormous economies of scope, etc., and uh, this um, presumption that uh, the market uh, by itself will fix all the problems. And this is, uh, we know that uh, all the debate about antitrust was basically started uh, with the creation of uh, the railways industry in the United States, which is the first industry 
with gigantic natural externalities, right? In a sense, until the creation of the of the um, of the railways, the idea that uh, laissez faire, laissez passer is what you need to to have to have uh, a, a, a free and competitive market uh, was a reasonable one. Uh, since the introduction of railways, you realize that uh, completely free and competitive are two different things. And so now you have to choose whether a market is free in the sense of devoid of every constraint or the every rule, or if it is really free in the sense that there is free entry and competition. I think those two are really um, two opposite meanings, but very often people use them interchangeably. And, and I think that uh, if that was true with the introduction of the railways is much, much more true today with the introduction of uh, uh, first uh, uh, the internet and now AI uh, th that rely heavily on, uh, uh, for example, access to data. Uh, and, and so they, they it's very, um, it's not a sector where it's easy to enter and uh, there are natural uh, economies of scale, economies of cope, and network scenarios that make it difficult for newcomers to compete. And so there is a natural tendency to have a monopoly. And what, what should be the response? Should, should we just acknowledge it as, 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 as an objective fact and try to accommodate in the kind of second tier in Europa League uh, cluster of, of, of strong, medium-sized companies? Or we try to, the ambition of Europe should to somehow to match it as in one way or another? No, I think that the idea is is to uh, create an environment where uh, these uh, um, economies of scale, network scenarios are less important. So, uh, and one thing is, of course, uh, uh, antitrust policy, but but the other is to favor the creation of this uh, stock system that uh, uh, gives uh, an equal opportunity to everybody. And in my view, there is also an important need, need to redefine uh, uh, privacy and digital property rights, uh, because those can be really uh, get in the way of, uh, um, for example, entry. So um, if uh, our de-anonymized data become accessible to everybody, and this is, after all, basically, who, is, who collected them didn't really pay for it or didn't pay much for it. And so maybe they retain a advantage for one or two years, but after that they become a public domain to train any AI system. That would be an enormous advantage, uh, enormous advantage. Uh, and I think we desperately need to do that uh, because uh, China as a, as a collateral effect of its uh, authoritarianism, has collected a lot of data uh, for a long period. And uh, there are just a lot of Chinese. So the combination of this um, gives uh, China a natural advantage in training AI. Um, and uh, Europe needs to start fighting back. And it looks that there are some initiatives like Data Act, Data Governance Act, which which an AI Act in, indeed, which look at least in this in this direction, which is quite quite uh, reassuring. But obviously, on the ground, it could be very different. So let 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 us up to the ground. And uh, you remember the discussions about the DMA. You remember the passion and the 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 the, gra the, the degree of of emotions uh, in the, in the first years when this this idea popped up in the in the in the political discourse and in in European e, e, EU law and policy context what is your view about the the the, the future and, and or or the, the presence of the of, of the DMA today should the, the direction of its development and the, its potential and real impact I think that the proof is in the pudding I think that uh, uh, all legislation tend to be inspired by reasonable principles is the application and implementation that uh, is where the rubber uh, meets the road and where the problems start to arise. So um, I think it's a little bit too early to say what is the impact of the, of the DMA. I think it will depend crucially on how it's going to be implemented. I think that the fact that uh, 
uh, the, the chief economist position of the uh, DigiCom is missing is not uh, a good thing. Um, and the fact that we're waiting for the election to do anything is not a good thing. So I think that uh, I don't expect this to have a, an impact uh, immediately. Uh, and so to, to really give an informed uh, evaluation, I think we need some time. But how would you, would you, where would you categorize yourself to those who want to, to, to do incremental changes to mainly vertically, trying to somehow to tame the omnipotence and omnipresence of those designated gatekeepers and what somehow doing, doing some marginal or maybe, but still, let's say quantitative changes to the, to the status quo or those who want rather radical revolutionary changes, bringing some qualitative uh, differences to, 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 to the very structure of digital market. What, what, what is hidden behind this two, two very general words of fairness and contestability in your view? Um, I really don't like your two stark distinction because I don't think uh, I'm a revolutionary. I don't want a revolution, but I do want to have a, a significant uh, impact. Um, and uh, I think that the real revolutions are done slowly and over time. Uh, the ones who are too fast and to sort of uh, uh, have a huge backlash. Um, so I think we need to make uh, some progress in the direction of interoperability. I think that uh, without uh, uh, effective competition, I don't think we have uh, an efficient economy and uh, our freedom is at, at risk. So I think that, uh, and, and we're not, uh, we don't have competition uh, without interoperability. So I think that that's, uh, to me, is the uh, issue I will focus the most. And thus, less uh, those obligations which have impact on end users, but rather, we're talking about businesses, business users, and their ability to to scale up, essentially, to, to, to climb so, yeah. up. So I will distinguish massively between consumer protection and uh, uh, competitions, because competition can fix some issue of consumer protection, but not all issues. So uh, my uh, area of expertise is finance, and I've seen in finance uh, sectors that are very competitive, but where uh, basically the business is to take advantage of unsophisticated players and squeeze them as much as possible. And uh, by increasing competition, you're not increasing efficiency, you're increasing the number of people who try to squeeze you. And so I think that uh, actually I see uh, consumer protection not only as a way to protect consumers, but also as a way to make the economy more efficient. Because if we have a lot of uh, businesses whose only function is to take advantage of unsophisticated people, um, they're really rent seeking, they're not producing anything good and they are wasting resources. So I think that uh, consumer protection is important for, for, the, for both reasons, is important in financial markets, is important also, of course, in digital markets. So that, that's one side of the equation. But then on the side of, uh, of the efficiency, I think that uh, the, the interoperability and the creating competition is, in my view, the solution. So a, a two-way track in which uh, you protect consumers uh, with some sort of a limitation. As I said earlier, uh, privacy rights are great, but they should not be infinite. Uh, they are not the most important thing uh, above all. Um, and uh, and so you you need to make some some trade off, and this trade off should be uh, decided politically, you know, not just uh, by some economists, but uh, it, it is a, a a choice. But at the end of the day, uh, in the same way in which uh, uh, I choose to automatically donate uh, some part of my body if I die, because I think that uh, this is uh, uh, good for the overall system, even. Um, if it's a hard thing to think about, um, I think that uh, uh, we we need to uh, uh, have uh, uh, legislation that uh, makes some trade-off between 
kind of uh, some uh, fundamental rights like privacy and uh, some uh, important benefits like uh, innovation and try to find uh, the right balance between the two. And this resonates very well with the current trend where we see several uh, systemic initiatives by, by big tech companies which go in line with enhancing privacy. So they they use privacy as a shield continuously and it's it's emerging situation and it looks that they learned adapted very quickly to this uh, greater demand uh, uh, of privacy and they can deliver it and that i actually not so sure because when when apple now starts to protect your privacy they simply are protecting your privacy against google because they want to be the only one exploiting you so I'm not so sure that they're doing it to protect you. It's not that uh, you have multiple choices and you can choose a lot the most protective one. It's more like uh, um, Apple uh, pursuing it, 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 its interests, which is in a free economy is fine as long as you have, on the other hand, a, a good regulator to say enough is enough, we have to put the limit. Yeah, but, but their narrative is quite convenient. So obviously the, 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 the intentions are self-evident but the narrative might be resonating with policymakers. and you made quite recently a very remarkable observation about the dna of policymakers who like simple choices who like i recollect your metaphor which somehow touches your my heart when you talk about covid and when the choice is between between the, the death of your old or the education of you of your young you, you 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 cannot make this choice by by uh, relying on your on your heart. You you refer to the objective science. So is it this kind of a, a systemic problem as well of this uh, quantification of everything? Um, but when I made that a, a, a example, I made an example precisely to say that it should not be delegated to experts because as an expert, I can tell you um, how many people more will die or many young people will uh, fall behind in education in a way that sometimes is uh, difficult to repair. Uh, but uh, how many 70 year old do you kill to uh, educate more than 18 years old? That's ultimately a political choice that uh, need to be done by politician with the support of the people. It's an uncomfortable position to, to make. I think that uh, it's much easier to campaign on, uh, I'm gonna cut taxes rather than say, I'm gonna do this. Uh, but we cannot relegate this choice to, uh, to the, uh, the technocrats because it is a political choice and, and, and many antitrust decisions are of the same nature and, and we should bring them in front of the population. And, and I think that the one between privacy and, and innovation is, is of that nature. And it's a, as an economist, I can tell you what are the costs and benefits of the two, but at the end of the day, the trade-off is a political decision. And let me just finish with this. And your message is that the over-reliance or inflating the value of privacy while acknowledging its fundamental importance can backfire. Absolutely. Let me revert to the final part of this conversation to a little bit of antitrust sociology, so to say. And I have two questions in this regard. First, I wanted to ask about the conference which you which you run annually. You do several events, the Stigler Center, but the one in, in competition on antitrust policy is kind of flagship, very impactful, very visible, noticeable. And you put together really people who advocate polar views. Obviously, they are very mature and respectful and their views are well established, but they fight. And some, some discussions are really, really uh, for students, for those who learn by watching them on YouTube very helpfully. This is a remarkable source of information. So how do you observe, how do you manage put them uh, such, such heterodox or uh, heterogeneous? A cohort of people together and how do they communicate? Is it like football players after after the game is a whistle blower, they shake hands, etc. Maybe some interesting observations. Um, first of all, uh, I would like to say that this is very much in the spirit of the University of Chicago. When we, were, uh, we started this conversation discussing what Chicago is about, I think that one of the things Chicago is about is about uh, 
not only freedom of expression, but intense debate uh, among different opinions uh, in uh, uh, the most civilized way possible. Okay, so that's really the spirit of uh, uh, Chicago back uh, in uh, in the in the 20s. At some point, uh, the president invited uh, a, a, I think it was the head of the then Communist Party, and there was a lot of backlash because of that. And he said, "No, I think that we want to hear everybody's opinion." Okay, so I think it's very important to have this uh, uh, broad perspective, which is incredibly rare these days uh, because people tend to create uh, small subcategories, um, but uh, should be really, should be everywhere. So I think that uh, uh, the, one of the benefits is we have a tradition of that. Um, and two, I think that uh, as everything in, in life, you need to be a little bit lucky because I think that uh, we uh, got the point of a, uh, of a change in which uh, uh, I think that a traditional uh, I.O. and a traditional uh, Chicago school was a bit stale. So I remember talking to Richard Posner, uh, who is one of the founders of the Chicago school. And, uh, and he, even he had doubts that we had gone too far. Okay, so I think that there was the sense, especially among the uh, the brightest and more open-minded in the group, that uh, things had gone a bit too far. Um, and so uh, the first year was a bit of a cultural shock uh, for people to have uh, uh, Nobel Prize economists in the same room with people from open market and, and so on and so forth. Um, but eventually, I think that... Uh, uh, was 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 good and people started to accept each other and you know you you need to um, uh, smooth out certain things uh, but I have to say uh, it's very healthy because uh, if you keep going among the usual uh, crowd you don't that provoke and you get uh, complacent and uh, and I have seen journalists asking tough questions to Nobel Prizes, okay? And while the Nobel Prizes would never admit that, I think that uh, the journalists had really a good point that they couldn't answer it, okay? And, uh, and of course, they got pissed. Uh, but I think that uh, because they're smart, they actually value this. Uh, so I think that uh, having this reality check with a broader community is really, really important. It's very easy to demonize the other, uh, but then the discussion starts to be really stale. Now, there is indeed a, an issue of uh, language, and that's always the problem when you have something a bit multidisciplinary, that uh, there is the risk of uh, talking over each other or talking past each other. So I think that uh, Moderators need to do a particularly good job, and most of them are able to do it, not all the time, because it's really a, good, a difficult job to try to translate what people say, because often when you speak different languages, you don't even hear uh, what the other person says. So it's not that uh, you dislike him or there is an uh, animosity. Maybe there is also that. But if you don't understand what they're saying, or don't see the point, there cannot be a, a, a conversation, right? Excellent. And another question about this uh, observation, and I, again, I don't expect a comprehensive, some scientifically measured answer about the, the, the state of affairs in U, US and European academia. You travel continuously, you know, obviously it depends on the area, on which European university or which European country we're talking about, and there are many, it depends. But still, maybe you, you see some, some more general differences, maybe we can learn something from US, or you would want US academia to, to take some European elements. What would be this? So, what I can tell you is uh, European academia is dramatically better at what it was uh, 34 years ago when I left uh, Italy to go study in the United States. Um, I think that the gap at the time was enormous. And uh, 
in part also because of communication. And uh, I feel like a dinosaur, but I always tell my students that one of the challenges in writing my master's thesis in Italy was that uh, I couldn't get a hold of certain working papers because uh, it was difficult to get them. Uh, today, everybody get access instantaneously over the internet. Uh, it was difficult for me to apply to some school in the United States because I didn't know what was the address to ask for the application for, okay? Uh, and when I tell this to young kids, they laugh because, uh, of course, with internet. So I think that um, internet has been an, an enormous equalizer, but also Europe has made an enormous uh, step forward. So uh, the quality of the European academia is... Uh, much, much better than it was uh, 34 years ago and uh, is getting closer to the quality of the United States. And uh, I think that Europe uh, uh, might have a, a great opportunity because, unfortunately, I see in the United States a, a level of intolerance that is not conducive to research, not conducive to innovation and so on and so forth. And and uh, I think that uh, uh, this is really a, a serious risk uh, of the demise of uh, the U.S. academia. After all, in the 16th century, uh, Italy was at the top of the academic world. And uh, why did they lose that primacy? Of course, there are a lot of explanations. One of my explanations is the Counter-Reformation, is, is the fact that uh, if you were so aggressive that uh, you go after Galileo Galilei because as a view that you don't like uh, is not conducive to innovation and research. And, and I think that that's, uh, uh, that's the way uh, your uh, uh, advantage in, in research uh, can be squandered. And, and Italy is an example of that historically. I think that the United States uh, is... Uh, uh, risking that. And, and that's something that is uh, very dangerous. And, and maybe, again, when we talk about digital markets, I ask you of you, maybe there is some jurisdiction or region which would be particularly interesting for you just to mention. Is there any beyond EU, UK and the United States which would be at least worth noting? Again, India? Um. I actually uh, am very nervous about Modi uh, and the language he uses because it, it is a language of uh, an authoritarian who tries to get his way also um, on uh, academic disputes or views and et cetera. And so these are precisely the kind of interferences that uh, um, are problematic. Um, and I think that the great advantage of Europe is that Europe has finally recreated a republic of the letters that used to exist in the 17th century uh, and even before. And people were going around uh, from place to place. And uh, uh, Joel Mokir, who is an economic historian, says that uh, one of the big advantages of Europe was precisely be fragmented so that uh, uh, you might be hated by... The Ita an Italian prince, but uh, somebody in France uh, will host you and vice versa. And so that level of uh, uh, confidence was very crucial to uh, the development of uh, knowledge in, in Europe. And I think it does remain uh, an advantage, at least for the time being. I, I don't know um, whether sort of uh, in the next election we're going to get... Uh, um, Marie Le Pen in France and AFD in Germany, then maybe we think differently. But I think at the, at the time being, uh, I think just the mere fragmentation is a huge advantage. So we want Erasmus program. Yeah, I, I always said Erasmus has been the best thing that Europe has done by far. And uh, I've always been, uh, my fear is the politician might have accelerated a bit too fast the integration because Erasmus by itself would have eventually brought integration. And the desire to accelerate might have created some backlash. But at this point, is, is, uh, 
just uh, uh, we, in the United States, we say Monday morning quarter, uh, quarterbacking or whatever. Uh, well, good revolutions but, have to be made slowly, as you mentioned. Yeah. Erasmus, and the last question, students, your recommendation to to, to those who start their, their, their job or who consider working in, in, in regulating competition in digital markets? Um, first of all, my uh, uh, always my advice in any field is travel and hear different opinions. I think that uh, uh, there is a lot that can be learned by seeing different uh, places and uh, seeing uh, smart people in, in different institutions and so on and so forth. And, uh, and, and I remember that uh, um, in, in the United States, we have this rule that uh, we don't hire our own students. And now there are some uh, agency reasons why uh, we chose to do that way. But I think it's also very healthy for the students that uh, you get a PhD in one institution and you're forced to go to another one to prove yourself. Uh, and uh, that's in part is the story of, you need to be exposed to different ideas. Uh, why innovation has always been connected with uh, uh, free trade of ideas and goods, uh, places that are at the center of uh, interchange because uh, um, Ideas are like uh, little bricks that need to be Lego bricks that need to be recombined in different shapes. And uh, the more variety, the better the, the buildings you can build. Luigi Zingales, thank you very much indeed for your time and for your great ideas, for sharing your, your thoughts with all of us. My pleasure.